Christian Church. It's good to see you guys this morning. We are excited to be in God's house and worshiping Him. Let's pray before we get started. God, we just love you so much. We thank you for everything that you are doing for us today, God, that we can be in your presence and worshiping you. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Will you stand with us and sing?
have sung those words, you are good. You are amazing. You are faithful. You are gracious, God, and you love me. You love each and every one of us here. Thank you so much for this this unending love, God, for the grace that, that, that just never ends, that we can never deserve, but you give so freely. God, we love you. We praise you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Hey, good morning. We're so excited that uh, we have this opportunity to uh, uh, baptize Jay, and uh, Jay's going all in today, and he's been uh, wanting to do this for a number of months now, and we've met with the family, and we're really excited about this. Uh, we had our uh, Baptist reorder for the new venue here, and it's fiberglass and it had a crack in it. So uh, we are making do with a trough, and so we're so excited that we get this opportunity to do this with Jay. And so Jay, I want to ask you a very important question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and do you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Yes. All right. I do believe. You all do. Believe. All right. Good for you. So I'm going to ask you to put your hand over there, and I'm going to lower you back there. Nathan, I'm going to help you. Ready? Okay. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in a new life. All right. Hey, he said it best himself. That was refreshing. It's still warm. It feels good. You can see I'm a little wet myself. Um, so it doesn't have to be just one. If you're feeling it today, if you're touched by David's sermon, please come forward. We have pastors up here at the end of service. We have pastors in the back at the end of service. Feel free to talk about it. It's, uh, it's always a good starting place. But hey, good morning. Welcome. Great to have you all here. The calendar, we, I know you guys are working on your calendars as fall is in swing. The school year is kicked up and we're off and going. I want to help you try to figure out your calendar, your scheduling as you're looking at events. If you pull out this program right now and you can open it up and you can see inside that we have a lot of different programming. We have groups. We have different events that are off and going that we're going to have going on for the next few months. This just gives you a little taste if you want to look at it. There's a lot of great opportunities to connect with other people in the church, to grow with the group, and to serve each other. Also in this program you have this connect card right here and if you you have any questions about anything if you have a prayer request if there's anything you want to ask if uh, you just want to say hey please fill this out we're gonna collect this later on during our time of communion and generosity you can just drop that right in the bag or we have boxes in the back that you can drop it in as well we also have one over for you guys over at the cafe well one thing that we want to make sure that everybody though is invited to is a night of prayer and worship that is one week from today that's September 22nd one week today at 6.30 p.m. right here in this very room. We're going to have musicians from all three campuses up here leading us in worship. We're going to have pastors from all three campuses up here leading us through prayer. Child care is provided. We're going to have dessert afterwards. The cafe is going to be open. It's going to be a great night. We're inviting all three campuses right here in this room. Again, that is September 22nd, one week today, 6.30 p.m. Did I mention that it's right here in this room? It's going to be great. All three campuses. It's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure that you don't miss it. Get that on your calendar. Well, hey, one th other thing. At North Northwest Christian Church, we love schools. We love teachers. We love the people that work for schools, the people that are pouring their hearts and their lives into the next generation. We appreciate them so much. Whether you're a teacher, a teacher's aide, whether you work at the front office, you're an admin, cafeteria, bus driver, custodial, whatever it may be. If, I, if that's you, though, would you please stand up right now? Um, and so we can just, can we give you a round of applause right now? Hey guys, please stay standing actually for one moment and let's all bow our heads in prayer. God, I thank you so much as this school year's kicked off and going, I, I pray over every single student, every single parent and family member, every single teacher and worker at the schools. God, specifically, I pray over those that are standing up right now, God. I pray that every interaction that they have with students, with parents and family, with coworkers, God, that they would see that as an opportunity to express the love that you have showed us, God. I pray for the day in and day out that you would give them the energy and that you would give them the boldness to continue to pour in every single day to those people, God. And I pray that they would constantly feel the support and the love that they have from their church family standing around them right now. So thank you for that, and it's in your name. Amen.
Hey, you guys can go ahead and be seated. We, uh, like I said, we appreciate you. We have a gift for you over at the Connect kiosk. If you want to grab that after service, you can go grab that at the Connect kiosk. Also, we have a free drink for you over at the cafe if you want to take advantage of that as well. Well, right now, I'm going to ask everyone to go ahead and stand up and ask somebody around you, who was your favorite teacher growing up? I want to ask you uh, one other thing today, and that is that uh, typically at Northwest Christian Church, we always uh, have a school supply drive, and with everything that's been going on, we just uh, have gotten behind on that, and so we know that every teacher needs more rulers, all right? They just need rulers, and so, uh, and some other school supplies as well, so we're asking that you would... Uh, Go out and you would find some school supplies. We have a little yellow bus out in the lobby area. And if you would bring those and then we can distribute them to the schools. Uh, they're counting on us to doing that. So if you could help us out, we'd really appreciate that uh, as well. Well, Walter and his wife were extremely worried. Their son missed the 1 a.m. curfew. And so they wait and they wait. They wait and they wait. They're wondering where in the world their son is. Finally, he shows up at 2 a.m. that morning. And now they even have more cause for anxiety because this is what he says. He calls out, Mom, Dad, I'm home. And whatever the punishment is, it was worth it. All right? <laughs> there is anxiety there for parents. Almost all of us in this room, we've experienced anxiety at one time or another in our life. Many of us, we still battle it every single day. Then there are various levels. For some of us, we have butterflies in our stomach. For others, it's sleepless nights. Sometimes it's hyperventilating. Sometimes it is passing out because of anxiety attacks. What we're talking about, though, is we're talking about this morning about waiting. Oftentimes, waiting is the hardest part in life. And waiting oftentimes causes us to be anxious. The Houston airport executives were dealing with this whole idea about waiting. Customer complaints were long and hard because they are having these long lines at the baggage claim. Has anybody ever experienced that yourself? All right? Yeah, a lot of us have, right? We wait at that carousel for our bag, and, and it never shows up, or it takes a long time. Well, it is so bad at this Houston airport that they know they have to deal with it. And so they get after it. The first thing they do is they decide they're going to hire more baggage claim handlers, all right? Baggage handlers. And that obviously did the job. They now got it down to where they were having to wait just eight minutes. That was way above industry standard. But what happened is people were still complaining about having to wait to pick up their bags. Now, they had to walk about one minute, a short walk, from the arrival gate to the baggage claim. They were not complaining about that wait, or that walk. They were complaining about getting there and having to wait. And so what they did at the Houston airport is they moved the arrival gates farther away from the baggage claim. So now, people have to walk farther, but they don't have to wait for their bags as long. And it actually solved the problem. In fact, people began complimenting the airport because their bags were waiting for them as they got there. You know what they discovered? Is they discovered something very, very important. It's what you do while you wait that makes the difference. It's what you do while you wait that makes the difference. The New York Times actually wrote an article about this, and they interviewed an MIT researcher. His name was Richard Lawson. He's considered the world's leading expert on waiting. I do not know how you get that title, but I want it, all right? Because I feel like I've had to wait a lot in life. And I could just give myself that title, right? Expert in waiting, and nobody would argue with me, right? Well, this is what Larson said. He said, it's actually predictable on what that airport did. The problem, again, that people have with waiting is they don't have anything meaningful to do while they wait. Nothing meaningful to do while they wait. So what actually helps is making them walk longer, giving passengers something to do in between. In between the time that they arrive and in between the time that they get their bags. You and I, those of us in this room, we also are living in between. 
We are living in between the birth of Jesus and when Jesus will come back again. We're waiting for Christ to come again. The question is this, what are we doing while we wait? That is the question, right? Sometimes it feels like we are just waiting. We're waiting and we're waiting. We're standing at the baggage carousel and we're just waiting on God to do something, to make things right. And for some of you, your prayers sound exactly that way. Your prayers sound like the customer complaint cards. God, what are you waiting for? God, when are you going to return? God, when are you going to make things right for me? That's what we sometimes talk about, right? God, when are you going to rescue my finances? God, when are you going to remove that addiction from me? God, when are you going to restore and put my marriage back together again? God, when? When, God? When? And we wait. And we wait. And while we wait, we often find ourselves anxious. And we're anxious because we want that calm. And we're waiting for that calm, but we're in the midst of chaos. We're in the midst of waiting. And then on top of that, we are waiting with other people who also find themselves waiting. And they also find themselves anxious. And so now we're around some other anxious people, and now we have even more chaos. We wait for the not yet, but oftentimes it feels like not ever. Not ever. We wait filled with anxiety over all this stuff, the stuff called life. And waiting is oftentimes hard. We're in week two of our series, Calm versus Chaos, When Anxiety Attacks. If you missed last week, I'm asking you to go back to our uh, our new website, and you can find that message online, listen to it, view it, whatever you need to do, get caught up. Because this series is like most of our series. If you just go to one or two of them, you're not going to get the full picture. That's not going to be enough. They build on each other. So don't be anxious about it. Just go back and go ahead and get caught up. But be anxious if you miss any more. All right, just say it. All right? Now, what happens is this. <clears throat> We're going through basically five, word, uh, five verses in Philippians chapter 4 through this whole series. In four weeks, we're going to look at five verses. Paul starts off this section of Scripture with something a little different, a little surprising, because remember, he's writing from jail. He's about to have his head chopped off by the Emperor Nero. So this is what he says in verse 6. He says, Do not be anxious about what? About anything. And we said last week, come on, Paul. Are you serious? Anything? And yes, anything. But what we learned last week is that this verse isn't saying that you and I will never, ever be anxious. Paul is saying that you and I don't have to live in a perpetual state of anxiety. You and I don't have to carry anxiety with us day after day after day after day. Right? Max Lucado, he has a great saying. He says the presence of anxiety is unavoidable. The prison of anxiety is optional. It's optional for every one of us. This is what we've been learning in this series. Not how we're never going to feel anxiety. Has anybody in this room ever felt anxious? Can I see your hands? All right? Yeah. Welcome to being human, and we're living in a fallen and a broken world. But what you and I are learning is how we can step outside of the prison of day-to-day -day anxiety. And I want to say this again, because this is so important for so many of you to hear. Sometimes anxiety is so severe that getting... Uh, professional help, getting counseling, getting meds is absolutely appropriate. God has given us doctors and counselors and meds, and we want to rely on those, right? And please hear this, there is no shame in this. You need help? Get it. You, you need help getting help? Let us help connect you with the right person, right? We have several counselors at some of our campuses. It's important. But I also want to make this also really clear is that anxiety is not always chemical. It's not always physical. Sometimes we have anxiety because it's a spiritual issue. Anxiety is a deep, deep, has a deep, deep spiritual component to it. We see in the New Testament that the, it talks about anxiety a lot. And we learned last week that the word for anxiety used in the New Testament is actually made up of a, a compound word. There's a noun and a verb. And the verb is to divide, and the noun is mind. And so what this word anxiety means is to divide our mind. Divide our mind in different directions. And you and I who are following Jesus, we better believe that if God wants us to have our, our focus, our direction towards Him, towards His Son, then we also have an enemy. 
And the enemy, his goal is he wants us to divide our mind in a hundred, a thousand different directions with all of these what ifs. And it's all to take us away from our direction on God, our focus away from God. I want us to understand today that one of uh, Satan's tools is anxiety. It is a deeply spiritual issue as well. So if you're tired of the chaos, if you're tired of going a hundred, a thousand different directions, and you want to move from chaos to calm, I want you to know that you are in the right spot this morning. So when anxiety attacks, and it absolutely will, as Christ followers, we want to make sure that we're approaching that by seeing what God has to say on how we can deal with anxiety and all of its attacks. And even if you're not a Christ follower, it's interesting that as we remove God more and more away from our culture, as we remove God more and more away from our country, that anxiety continues to skyrocket. It's at its highest level ever. More anxiety is in our country than at any time before. But I said in all this of chaos, that God is waiting as well. That God is waiting for you and for me to come back to Him, to seek His counsel, to seek His ways, His words on how we can deal when anxiety attacks. That's what He wants. Because God has given us a blueprint for peace in the midst of all kinds of chaos, in the midst of what you are experiencing as well. So in Philippians chapter 4, you might want to open up your Bible, your Bible app to that. And again, like last week, I want us to read that out loud together. I promise to go slower, all right? But what my goal is, is by the end of this series, that you and I will have memorized these five verses, all right? In fact, we had man cave last night, uh, and it was exciting. We had some uh, guys here, their sons, and it was really cool. One of the sons, Wesley Cook, he came up to me, and we worked on verses last week, four and five, and he recited it to me just like that, all right? So we can do this. All right, we're going to Philippians 4. Here's what we're going to read. We're going to read this together out loud. Ready? Rejoice in the Lord. The Lord is near. Come on louder now. Let's go. Here we go. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts, hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, let's finish strong. If anything is excellent, think about such things. Let's pray. God, these are powerful words. We want them to be more than just words that we hear or the words that we say. We want these to be the words that we live, that we hold on to in the midst of the chaos, that we hold on to this promise, Lord, that we can have this peace that transcends all understanding. And God, that we can have it because you are God. So God, as we continue in your word today, help this to be real to each and every one of us, no matter what kind of anxiety we're experiencing today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said? Amen. So last week was verse 4 and 5, and it showed us the first thing that you and I need to do when anxiety attacks is that we celebrate. All right? We rejoice. That's what Scripture says. And sometimes we are struggling, right? So we're supposed to celebrate in our problems. I might lose my job. Hey, let's celebrate that. My marriage is crumbling, woo-hoo, right? No, that doesn't make sense at all. So we understand Paul, he's not telling us, right, I don't want you to rejoice in our worries and anxiety in our situations. No, what we do is we rejoice in one thing and one thing only, and that is that we rejoice in the Lord always. So I'll say it again, rejoice. We rejoice in the Lord. We celebrate these two truths about God. We celebrate God's goodness, and we celebrate God's control. And what we said last week is that peace is found in between these two goalposts, God's goodness and God's control. When you and I find ourselves in this zone, right here between these two goalposts, just like the Dallas Cowboys won last week, all right, we are winners. We're in the right zone. But if we are wide right or we are wide left, we have to understand that we're not going to experience all that God has for us. God, he says, be in this zone, the winning zone, understanding my control and my goodness. And when you and I, when we can do that, 
we can take a deep breath. No matter what we're experiencing, no matter what kind of anxiety attacks, we know that God is good. So that is the very first thing. We remember God, who God is. And this morning, Paul says, there's another step when anxiety attacks. And it's found in verse 6, and this is what we're going to read. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in how many situations? In every situation, all right? I don't know if you know what the word every means in the Greek, but this is what it means. It means every, any, all, all right? That's what it means. What Paul is trying to say is, hey, you might think this is going to cover anything, anything that you and I ever experience, anything that we go through. He's saying in every situation, Paul's making it really abundantly clear. Here's your next step in every situation. Here's what Paul is telling us to do. And this is what we see, all right? He says, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your what? Your request to God. So again, Paul is giving us a very clear picture on what to do when anxiety attacks, when you and I start becoming anxious, we have a choice. And our choice is we can turn to prayer or we can turn to despair. It's prayer or despair. When we're anxious, we have this incredible opportunity. I'm telling you, we get to go to the creator of the universe who's put everything in place and we get to go to him. He says, I want to hear from you. I want you to tell me what's going on, what you're anxious about. We can become very specific through him. That's what we want to make sure. So this is what the deal is. Paul says, you want to move from chaos to calm? You want to make sure this. Peace is found on the path that is paved with prayer. Peace is found on the path that is paved with prayer. So let me ask you, when anxiety attacks, and again it will, when you feel anxious, is God the very first person that you turn to? Or do you turn to someone else? Or do you turn to something else? Maybe it's you turn to alcohol. Or maybe you turn to shopping. Or you go eat something. Or you go turn to pornography. I mean anything. right? Anything to help my mind be distracted from the anxious thoughts that I'm having right now. And so for many of us, and it's true for me way too often, prayer is often our last option instead of our first line of defense. Now let me say this. If you struggle with anxiety, for many of us, today will be the most challenging day. But I also think that today will also be the most helpful day. And here's why. Because some of us, even in this room, we have given up on prayer. We've given up praying for our anxiety. Because what's happened for some of us is we've been praying and praying, and then we've been waiting and waiting and waiting. We've been waiting in that, that baggage carousel for a long, long time. And so nothing has showed up, and so we're thinking this just doesn't work. Or maybe for some of you, you're so sick of being told by some of these other Christ followers that you shouldn't be anxious at all. You should never have these anxious thoughts. All you need to do is to pray harder. And you go and pray harder. I mean, some of you, like me, think, I've tried. I've actually cried. I've tried some more and some more. And I wait, and I still wait, and I wait some more. And still I do this battle every single day. And so you start to think, it just doesn't work. I can't pray this away. And again, some people get so frustrated, and maybe here is you, that you have given up on prayer for anxiety. If that's true, I want us to pause for just a moment. Can I challenge you about this? If prayer does not work for anxiety, then why in the world would Paul tell us to pray when we're anxious? Why would he say, this is what I want you to do when anxiety attacks? May I suggest that if you've been frustrated with prayer, and after waiting, and waiting in chaos, and praying has not helped you move to calm, has not helped you to move to peace, if you've given up on praying when anxiety attacks you, would you pause? Would you pause and, again, take a deep breath? And would you think for just a few moments about what we're going to do? Would you consider the words that we're going to present? The reason is because I believe embedded in this verse from Paul is a way for you and for me to specifically pray when anxiety attacks. And I think that many people miss this. So can it be, or could it be, in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of this waiting, that you and I have missed how we can pray specifically when anxiety attacks? If you, in this room, if you've been sinking anxiety, maybe there's a way that you and I can pray that has more power over anxiety than we ever, ever thought before. It's interesting to me 
that when you look at the New Testament, you see Jesus, you follow his life. Jesus has these disciples, his followers, and they're raised in good Jewish homes. They were taught to pray from an early age. Prayer is a part of their everyday life. But these followers of Jesus, they come to him one day, and I think they're probably frustrated somewhat, and they say, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? Teach us how to pray. Because as they were following Jesus around, as they were doing life together with Jesus, what they discovered was this, that his prayers seemed to have more power. They seemed to be more effective. So in the same way, I think this verse that Paul has for us this morning is telling us a way that we can pray, that we has more power over anxiety. He's saying there's a way that you and I can pray when anxiety attacks. And there's a way that we can pray where we truly can be moved from chaos to calm that can give us a peace that transcends all understanding. That's what Paul says here, right? And then he says this. This is how he wants us to pray. He says, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now what's interesting is there are three words there. They're all about prayer. Paul uses these three words, right? Prayer, petition, request, and they're all synonyms. They're all Greek words, the same Greek word, different Greek words for the one word prayer. And you go, why did he do that, right? He puts them all in a row, right there, three in a row, just like that. Why does he say, hey, guys, I want you to pray. Here's the one word he uses, right? No, that's not what he does. I think maybe, just maybe, it's because this is a progression, a progression for each and every one of us when anxiety attacks us on how we can all pray in a significant way when we're anxious. There's a more powerful way, a more effective way. So let's look at those three words. The first word that he uses is the word prayer. So this simply means this. This is our approach to God in prayer. God, I know you can handle this. God, I know you're still on the throne. You're the creator of the universe. I want to pray, all right? I'm gonna pray to you. Now petition, it simply means requesting help. God, I need your help in this situation. And then we get to the word request. And the word request actually means this. It means I'm asking you something very specific. I'm asking you something very definite. This is what I believe that I need. All right? And so I need this. This is a progression that I think will make a difference for every one of us in this room. Right? I want you to look at a bullseye. Right? We've all seen bullseyes. For me, sometimes, I don't get the bullseye. I might hit the target. But I'm not close to the bullseye. And what Paul is saying is we need to get more and more closer to the bullseye. We need to be very specific. We need to be exact. So he would say that the key for you and for me to deal with anxiety with our prayer is that you and I get ultra specific. Don't just say, God, help, help, help me, God. Instead, tell God exactly what you're anxious about, what you're dealing with. Be very specific in what you need from him. I, I've always liked this one story about this dad who overhears his little girl praying in her bedroom. But what he hears as a prayer is actually her reciting the alphabet. She says, dear God, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And she just goes on. And she does that several times. Finally, curiosity gets the very best of him. And so he goes into her room and she says, honey, why are you praying the alphabet? And, and this is her response. Well, Daddy, I wasn't sure what to pray, so I decided to pray all the letters of the alphabet, and I'm going to let God put them together how he thinks best. All right? Well, that's kind of cute. But let me ask you this. If you and I were to evaluate our prayer life, where do you live? Do you live more in the general, or are you really specific? Are you ultra-specific? Again, it seems like for me, I'm oftentimes outside that bullseye. So Paul, he's coming along, and he said, hey, when anxiety attacks, I want, you want to move from chaos to you want to move to calm? Then you have to get from the outside edge, right? It's not good enough to just get to the target. I want you to get into that bullseye area. That's where you're going to have power over anxiety. For example, I don't know if you've ever had children, your own or somebody else's children, they come up to you, and they're very upset. And you know something's wrong from the very beginning. And so you ask, hey, what's wrong? And they say, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, right? They say that over and over again. And sometimes you have to say, whoa, just slow down. Julie says, David, use your words, all right? I don't know what that's about, all right? Or sometimes your kids are older, right? They ask you for help. But it is so vague, you don't really know how you're going to help them. You don't even have any idea really what they're asking. So 
patiently, because pa parents are very patient with their teenagers, all right? You ask them, well, what's wrong? And they say, nothing, right? Or maybe they go on and say, well, I'm just sad. Or I just had a bad day. And then they add ever so kindly, just leave me alone, all right? Just go away, all right? Now, again, you're a good parent, so you try to understand, so you try to dig in some more. Teenagers always appreciate that, all right? Well, tell me something more. Can you talk to me and open up? And sometimes they open up a little bit more, right? I just had some trouble with my friends, right? It's a hard day at work. All right, I'm just feeling anxious. And of course, you want to know, well, what are you anxious about? Because you know that until they name what they're anxious about, what they're concerned about, you don't know how to help them. And we see it in all other kinds of relationships, not just parenting and teenagers or little kids. In marriage, or I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but do you ever experience your spouse when you know you know they're upset with you, and they've not said a word, right? It's their body language, it's their facial expressions. You know they're very upset. And again, you want to be a good husband or a good wife until you ask what's wrong, and they quickly respond, nothing. Well, I'm telling you, men, nothing always means something, all right? Just a little free marriage advice, all right? Nothing always means something. Again, here's what we all know. All of us know, no matter what kind of scenario I could paint, that until you know, it's hard for you to help, right? You can't really help nothing. You can't even help something. You gotta know what it is that they're dealing with, what they're anxious about. And may I suggest this? Paul is saying the same thing to us. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That's what he wants us to do. What exactly is bothering you? If we never name it, we can't really deal with it. Now, there are a couple reasons so many of us don't do this when it comes to our prayer life with God. Number one, it's, it's, it's hard, all right? It's just hard. That means I gotta do a little bit of digging, right? It takes some digging and there might be some pain involved and I just don't wanna do that. I just wanna stay up on the surface. I think the other reason is because some of the things that make us anxious, well, sometimes they just seem so small. They seem kind of dumb. Right? And where we feel dumb. We say to ourselves, if I ever told God this, he would just laugh at me. David, do you think that pain in your neck is a tumor? Come on, David, be serious. David, you're worried about work? Come on, there's nothing there, right? Don't worry about that small stuff. David, I'm just going to swap that away. I don't care about that stuff. Hey, that's not true. That's not a true reflection of God. God wants to hear from you, from every one of you. He wants to hear from you. Get specific. Now, some of you have been thinking, David, what's the point? I know my Bible. God already says he knows what we need even before I ask. And you're absolutely right. So why should I get specific with God? Well, what if getting specific isn't for God? It's really about you. It's what it's going to do for you, how it's going to help you and me. I want to look at another passage that I think will illustrate this well. So again, open up your Bible app or your, or your Bible to Mark chapter 10. Jesus is in Jericho, and this is what he's going to say in verse 46. He says, a blind man, you got to hear that, a blind man, Bartimaeus, he's sitting by the roadside, and he's begging. So can you imagine? Here's the scene. He's got all kinds of anxiety. He's blind. He has to beg. He doesn't know if he'll ever get another meal. He doesn't know when that next meal is going to come. He's really stressed out. He has all kinds of anxiety, all right? But now he hears that Jesus is walking by. So in verse 47, we see this, all right? He began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, Jesus, help me. And many people rebuked him and said, shut up. Well, they said, be quiet. But it was actually shut up. All right? Be quiet. And by the way, that's what some people tell you about your prayers as well. Don't bother God with that. You're anxious about that? Are you kidding me? Come on. Don't bother with God. All right? Verse 48. This guy, he doesn't listen to him. He shouts all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Help me, Jesus, help me. That's what he's saying, right? Over and over again. Help me, help me, help me, Jesus. And this is exactly where some of us are with our prayer life. God, help. God, help me. Help me. Help me, God. Now, Jesus hears him because Jesus always hears us. Now, I want you to watch what Jesus does because this is really kind of amazing, all right? Jesus calls this blind man over to him. All right, so in verse 50, this is what we read, all right? Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet, and he came to Jesus. you got to picture this in your mind, right? you got to see this scene. 
All right, here's this blind man. He hears Jesus coming. Jesus says, come over here. So he jumps up, and I don't know, he's blind, right? So he's trying to walk or stumble, or maybe he's crawling. He's trying to find where Jesus' face is, right? He finds Jesus' face. He gets to Jesus. Now, listen. Listen to what Jesus asks this blind man. Blind Bartimaeus, right? This is what he says. Verse 51, all right? Jesus says to blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Are you kidding me? Seriously? What, what is Bartimaeus thinking? Uh, Jesus, um, you know, this is what I, or his disciples, what are they saying to him? Jesus, he's blind. Did you not see that? Did you not pick this up, Jesus? He's blind. Can't you see that? Of course Jesus didn't miss this, right? I'm saying when Jesus asks a question, it's not for him as much as it is for us. All right, so now look at verse 52. All right, the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to do what? I want to see. That's what, I oh, got it. Jesus, I want to give you this very specific anxiety in my life. I'm going to actually name it. This is exactly what I'm anxious about, Jesus. This is exactly what I think that I need from you, Jesus. Okay, that's a specific request. I'm going to work with that. Again, this man goes, help, 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 Jesus, help me, right? Very generic. And then he says, here's what I want. Here's what I exactly I need. I need to see. All right? We need to get specific, not for Jesus' sake, but for ours. Here's the bottom line question. Do you believe, do you believe that God wants to help you when anxiety attacks? Do you believe that God wants to move you from calm? That God wants to move you to the peace when anxiety attacks you? Of course he does. That's the answer, right? Here's what Paul is teaching us in this passage. He wants to help us. So the more that you and I pray specifically, the more that you and I pray specifically, the more that God can ease our anxiety. The more that he can ease your anxiety. The more he can move us from the chaos to the calm. That's what Paul is suggesting here. Now, Max Lucado and a couple other people have given some reasons why specific prayer is really important. And here's the first one. Specific prayer really does get to the root issue. I think this is probably one of the most important things, right? The reason why God wants us to pray specifically about our anxiety. Because oftentimes we feel anxious, but we've not ever defined exactly what we're anxious about. Partly because anxiety is a what if, right? It's a future fear. We're not really sure exactly what it is, but we're anxious. Or we think it's just one thing, but in reality it's something else that's going on inside of us. So A becomes a presenting issue. We, we say this is what I want to help with, but actually it's something else. It's B, right? And so we have to understand this is the real issue. This is where a counselor is really, really helpful. All right? So God wants you and I to name our anxiety. Oh, God, I need help with my work, with my kids, with my family, with my spouse. No, 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 no. That's not it. All right? got to dig in. you got to drill down. What's the root issue? I mean, it's one thing to say, hey, God, I'm really anxious about work. It's another thing to dig a little bit deeper and say, well, really, God, what I'm anxious about is a specific project that I'm doing at work. I'm really concerned about this project at work. It's like moving the worship services to a gym, God. God, if this doesn't come through, everybody's going to think I'm a failure. Everybody's going to think I'm a loser. Did I just say that out loud? All right. Amazing, right? In other words, God, God, I'm really anxious about failing you. I don't want to disappoint any people that I really, truly love. I don't want to be an impediment to anybody coming and connecting to Jesus. God, I, I really need this help, right? And God, would you remind me that my identity is found in you. It's not in my work. It's not in my projects. It's in you. God, thank you for that reminder. Right? That first prayer is randomly thinking about work. God, help me with work. And then the second prayer is our narrow prayer that says, here's the specific thing that I'm really uh, concerned about. I'm anxious about this. God, I'm anxious about my body image. God, I have these, image, uh, these issues with uh, comparisons with other people. No, what are you really anxious about? you got to dig down deeper, right? Dig deep. Well, I'm anxious, God, actually, that Maybe nobody will ever think that I'm beautiful. God, I'm anxious that maybe I will never, ever have a spouse. God, I'm anxious that my spouse might not ever love me again because of the way that my body looks. God, I'm anxious about my marriage. No, what are you really anxious about? Well, God, really I'm anxious about the financial implications that might happen if my marriage doesn't make it. Okay, those are some things. I'm asking you to make sure that you dig deep. Really name those things. It's hard. It's uncomfortable. It, it's painful at times, but I'm asking you to do it. You've got to get to the root of the anxiety issues that you're dealing with. And what some of you are going to discover as you dig down deep is what you're really anxious about is that you have some guilt or you have some shame down here. 
and, and of some guilt and shame that you've never dealt with or you've never even allowed God to deal with. And I'm asking you to make sure that you go that extra mile. Now, if you're new to this whole Christian thing, you got to understand this, that God forgives us. God forgives all of our sin. It doesn't matter what kind of sin it is, God forgives us. And, and if you're uh, never ever named Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm not sure you're ever going to be able to fully deal with your anxiety because you're never going to fully understand this whole idea about forgiveness. All right? Again, God doesn't care where we've been. He doesn't care what we've done. God cares for us right where we're at. And he loves us so much that he doesn't want to stay with us, so he, uh, stay where we're at. So he wants us to have that abundant life. Quickly, we've got to go through these other ones. Number two, specific prayer is a really serious prayer. Someone says, hey, David, hey, why don't we have dinner? Why don't we hang out sometime? Would that be good? Well, that's kind of generic, right? So they may mean that or they may not. But if somebody else comes up to me and says, hey, David, let's have dinner Friday night, 6 p.m. We're going to go to Burgerville. I'm going to buy. We'll wrap it up by 7 p.m. Well, now I know they're pretty serious, and they also have a lot of class because we're going to Burgerville. All right? So that's good. In our prayer life, when we're specific, God knows that we're serious. We believe that he can move in this specific anxiety that I'm dealing with in my life right now. And we know from Scripture that faith and prayer are connected together. They're linked together, which leads to number three. Specific prayer grows our faith in God's goodness. If you and I, if we just pray these generic prayers and God comes through, our anxiety fades over a period of time or something changes, we might not give God the credit. Oh, it just took some time. Oh, you know what? I was pretty lucky. It didn't last as long as I thought. No, right? But when we pray very specific prayers and then God answers, that then grows our faith. My wife prays what she calls very specific elephant-sized prayers. And what happens is because she's very specific in those elephant-sized prayers, the only way that's ever going to happen is because it's a God thing. God, you answer this. Thank you for answering this. That grows her faith. And this especially is true when it comes to our anxiety. This is what's so important to build our faith in God, a God who loves and cares for us, a God who's in control and a good God as well. Number four, specific prayer can lead to specific passages of Scripture. One of the most effective ways that we can pray, again, is to be able to name exactly what we're anxious about. But then let's add this. All right, find a passage of Scripture that fits that, and then you pray that passage of Scripture. So what we're asking is you find a promise in Scripture, right? And then you find it that's dealing with your issue, and you make a prayer out about that. I don't know if you've ever done, done that, but I'm telling you it's really good. Prayer is good, all right? Just talking to God is always going to be good. Keep on doing that. But if you want to continue to develop and get deeper in your prayer life, learn how to pray Scripture over your life. Pray Scripture, God's Word, into your life. And you say, why? Well, look what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 4. He says, beginning in verse 12, I think we're going to have it on the screen, right? For the Word of God is alive and what? Active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. And then he goes on and he says this. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. That is so important. God's Word is really powerful. So that's why we want to pray it into our life. So again, find a promise from God's Word that fits your problem, and then write it out, screenshot it, whatever you need to do, and then make a prayer about it, all right? Get specific. I'm really afraid, and then you name the issue that you're afraid about. And then you find this scripture, right? Psalm 23, verse 4. says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. God, I'm really afraid of this job at work, right? This one project they have me on, man, it just seems like a black hole. I'm scared. I'm afraid. God, thank you that you will never leave me, that you will walk through the darkest valley with me. You will be close. Do that, right? Wonder if God still has a purpose for your life? You go to Philippians chapter 1, at verse 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. God, I don't know if you still have a purpose for my life. I'm older, I'm retired now, I don't know if what you're going to do with me, God. God is still working in my life. God, thank you that you're still working and that you're not completing me yet, but you will complete me one day. Right? That's what we're saying. Now, some of you say, well, David, I would love to do that, but I just don't know the Bible very well. I don't know how I'm going to get that. So here's how you find out, all right, how to use Scripture in a specific ver uh, issue that you're in, in your life, and that is you Google it, okay? So seriously, <laughs> you just Google it, all right? Type out what you're anxious about, and then you add the words, two words, Bible verse. And you'll be amazed, right? You'll find all kinds of verses, uh, the passages that God speaks to your situation. And so then, make that your prayer. But I'm telling you, for all of us this morning, it is time. 
it's time to use prayer as a first line of defense when anxiety attacks. If you've given up on prayer, it's time for you to pray differently. I know some of you are tired of the chaos. You're tired of the anxiety. But God hears you. God is good. He wants you to spray, pray specifically about that. Because God is still on the throne and he is still in control. We want to give you some different opportunities to pray. Every week we say, hey, we got some staff members up here at front and we want to pray with you and for you. This week what we've done is we have three stations in the back there with some crosses on there. They have a little slip of paper. My anxiety is. Just write what that anxiety is and then would you lay it down at the cross? Would you leave it there? We'll also have some people there that want to pray with you or for you as well. They would love to do that. We actually have some communion there. So maybe as we do this next set of songs, you're going to just sneak up there and you're going to go back and you're going to start praying and you're going to take communion then. We're going to pray and we're going to have communion for all of us though. Right now I'm going to ask the ushers to go in the back and get ready to serve us. The band's going to come back up here. But we want to have this time of communion because we again remember that God is good, that God has a plan, that God has a control. And so we remember that Jesus went to the cross. And Jesus said, would you do this in remembrance of me? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to pass some trays. They have two cups. They're stacked on each other. They have this little wafer of bread. They have some grape juice. Symbolic of Jesus' body and blood that he gave for you on the cross because he hears you, because he wants you to have an abundant life. He wants to hear you when you're dealing with anxiety. And so we're going to do this in remembrance of him. So whenever you're ready, you take those cups. And then as we sing that next song, we're just going to pass these bags and we're going to have this opportunity to be generous. We're going to give our tithes and our offerings because we believe that's what God wants us to do as well. He's so generous to us, he wants us to be generous back so we can spread that generosity as well. So first let's pray and then we'll go. God, again, we love you. Thank you so very much for loving us. God, we're thinking about some of us that are really anxious right now. We're struggling, and we want to believe those words are true, but we're still not sure. God, in this moment of reflection, in this moment where we see that Jesus went to the cross, where we remember that he gave his life willingly for us, where we remember that he's coming back again, that he rose from the dead, God, would you help us to be reminded that you are that kind of powerful God, that you love each and every one of us, and that we don't have to continue in this anxiety. So God, we do this now in remembrance of Jesus, and it's in his name we pray, amen.
Amen. Again, if you uh, would love to have prayer, we'd love to have an opportunity to pray with you. Mark's here. Debbie will be here. We have some others. And again, we have the stations in the back with the crosses. We'd love to pray with you as well. And remember, next Sunday night, we have an all-campus prayer and worship night. That's a great way also, if you're dealing with anxiety, to make sure that there's room for God as well. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you next week.